Holy and godly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Praise God for his word. A very good Good Friday morning to everyone. You need a double uh, goodness for today. That's only once a year that you do that. Praise God. Now, you can read about what happened at Calvary from the four Gospels in the New Testament. Uh, but if you want to understand a little bit more about the so what, you have to go into the New Testament epistles. And I want to go into the major epistle of Paul uh, to the Romans. And you can call this Paul's Gospel if you like, uh, where we are going to look into the so what. Now, when somebody is deceased, uh, it is quite common for people to ask, um, what did he or she die of. So that's the cause of death. But less common uh, would be asking the cause for which that person died. So not, not what did he die of, but what did he die for. Of course, most of us uh, will, will just Go on, right? Uh, you may die of uh, in your sickness. You may die in your sleep. Um, and it's just time to go. In fact, Jim Elliot uh, once wrote this in his journal. And I think he lived this out. He says, When it comes time for you to die, make sure the only thing to do is to die. In other words, live your life to the hilt so that you have no regrets. You do all that God has intended for you to do. So, today we are going to ask this second question. Not, uh, what did he die of? Of course, he died on the cross. He died of crucifixion. But, what did he die for? So, this is the more important of the two questions. Reason is because um, it doesn't end there with his death by crucifixion. There are vital implications and consequences of the death of Jesus Christ that last throughout eternity. Now, I get this title actually from a song by a lady called Twyla Paris. In fact, it was a hit in the contemporary Christian uh, music charts in the year 1996. So this is the title of the song, What Did He Die For? Uh, it, it is not a, a worship song, it tells a story, and it is about the death of two young men in the prime of their life. The first of which is an American soldier in 1944, um, and he died for his country. And the second is, of course, Jesus in the year AD 33. Now, both of them died for the freedom and liberation of others. One was political and military, and the other is spiritual. And, of course, it's a stark reminder to us uh, today of 
the necessity. People are fighting and dying in Ukraine uh, for their freedom, for the freedom of their country against the unjust aggression by the Russian invade, invaders. Now, let me just read through uh, the stanzas here so that you can get the drift of what this song is about. He was 21 in 1944. He was hope, he was courage on a lonely shore, sent there by a mother with love beyond her tears, just a young American who chose to rise above his fears. And as I watch him struggle up that hill, without a thought of turning back, I cannot help but wonder. To the darkest day in AD 33 came the mercy and compassion of eternity, sent there by a father with love beyond his tears, blameless one, the only son, to bear the guilt of all these years, and as I watch him struggle up that hill, without a thought of turning back, I cannot help but wonder. And here is the chorus. What did he die for when he died for you and me? He made the sacrifice so that we could all be free. I believe we will answer each to heaven for the way we spend the priceless liberty. Look inside and ask the question, what did he die for? And we have sung uh, in the songs just now about liberty and freedom. So I want to go into these simple six verses from the great Roman epistle, chapter 5. And you can divide them into three pairs. And they give us three answers to this question. What did Jesus die for? Now, if somebody has laid down his life and shed his blood for us so that we can be free, we can enjoy freedom, you know, whether it's, it's in a war or in this case, by the Lord Jesus spiritually. It therefore behoves us to spend time to reflect and to remember the reason, what did he die for? So that we know better how we should spend this priceless freedom and liberty. All right, so here's the first two verses. And reason number one can be summarized as follows. It's taken from the two verses that we are going to read. But let me just summarize this point for you. Here's the first reason. Christ died for the ungodly when we were still without strength. Okay, that's from verse 6 and 7. Christ died for the ungodly when we were still without strength. Let's read 5 verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, in, in each of these three pairs, you will find the occurrence or the reference uh, to the fact that Christ died. Verse 7, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. So first of all then, Christ died for who? Christ died for the ungodly. Who are the ungodly? That means people who are without God. They don't know God. And therefore, they are unlike God in their nature and disposition. Now bear in mind that God made man originally in his image and likeness. So we are made to be godly, to be godlike. And then with the entrance of sin, that image and likeness of God was marred and disfigured. That was because of the original sin committed by our first parents, Adam and Eve. So, in other words, there was dignity in the makeup of man before there was depravity. And when you say ungodly, it doesn't refer only to people who curse and swear, you know, uh, people who are irreligious or people who are immoral. We are 
all of us ungodly by natural birth and by our spiritual heredity. So it's something we're born with. We're not bred to be sinful. Now, when we read that phrase, when we were still without strength, well, it describes our helpless condition in a state when we are still without Christ. You know, although there are many things that we can still do and function physically, yet spiritually, we have to admit that we are stricken with a total disability. This, this is due to our inherently sinful condition. The theologians have a word for this. It's called the total depravity of man. It's total. So, we are all rotten apples at the core, even though on the outside we may look good sometimes. We have this story, uh, tradition, of this English martyr from the 16th century, who was a reformer by the name of John Bradford, not so well known. But one time he saw a criminal being led to his execution. And as he watched him, he said, There, by the grace of God, goes John Bradford. <laughs> so in other words, he's saying, That's me. That criminal going to the gallows is me. But for the grace of God, I'm not there. But by the grace of God, he himself uh, was to be a martyr later on. He died a martyr's death. He was condemned by men, but he was commended by God. But in his phrase, it tells us that he understood totally the total, the totality of, of the depravity of man. So in other words, but for the grace of God, I'm just as bad as the worst of the lot. And even the Apostle Paul said more or less the same thing in his own words. 1 Timothy 4.15, worthy of our memorization. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm number one, <laughs> of whom I'm chief. So that gives us the spiritual definition of godliness and ungodliness. Then he comment on the uh, phrase, the right time, in due time. It says it was in due time. It's the right time that Christ died. Because his death was not an afterthought. His death on the cross was part of God's ordained, foreordained plan and purpose. I think it was alluded to just now, either in the comment or in the prayer. Uh, you will read about this in Revelation, in one place where it says, of the Lord Jesus as the Lamb, all right, the Lamb of God. Now, the Lamb in Revelation 13.8 is described as being slain, not at Calvary in AD 33, but from the foundation of the world. So, in point of historical fact, it happened at Calvary in the year around about AD 33. But in the divine mind of God, it was there from the foundation of the world. It existed from then. And the staggering scope of his death, his sacrificial death, his voluntary death, he laid down his life, nobody forced him to do it, includes, the scope includes the ungodly, it includes the undeserving. And we don't see that until we come to the foot of the cross. And in the verses that we have read, he is comparing this to the rarity of dying for someone else, humanly speaking, 
You wouldn't do that for somebody who's undeserving or ungodly, a wicked person, right? Maybe once in a blue moon, you might come across an instance like that, like a mother dying for a child, a son dying for his father, somebody dying for his uh, good or best friend, or a righteous man, but certainly not for a wicked or a bad person. But, you see, God's definition and estimation of goodness, godliness, is different from ours. In another place from this great Roman epistle, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. So that's universal, right? Uh, and Paul there was actually quoting from the Psalms. And it is mentioned not once, but twice in Psalm 14, as well as Psalm 53, in verses 1 and 2. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, and there is none who does good. And further on, verse 3 of the same two Psalms, when something is mentioned twice in Scripture, it is very, very important for us to remember. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. So, you see, according to these verses in the, in the Scriptures, it tells us that atheism is foolish. It tells us that humanism is a fallacy. Atheism is the belief that there is no God. And according to these two Psalms, it's, it's foolishness to believe that there is no God. Because evidence is all around us in creation. And it is folly, it is a fallacy uh, to believe in humanism, which is the belief that I can have the potential to be good in myself without God. In other words, it's the belief that I am my own God. That's a fallacy. So that's the first big reason. And I can say that again. Christ died for who? The ungodly. When? When we were still without strength. Let's go on to the second pair. Verses 8 and 9. The summary here to the answer is, Why did he die for? What did he die for? Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Verse number 8, God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So there's a reference to the death of Christ. 9, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So let me unpack that. There are a number of very key phrases that I need to comment on. Now, if you are a Christian already, these things are good because it will reinforce uh, your arsenal of reasons to be able... We're, we're told in, in Peter's epistle that we should be ready to give a reason uh, for what we believe. You should know what you believe and why you believe and be ready to explain that when somebody asks you. Now, Christ died for the ungodly. Secondly, here it says Christ died for sinners. Now, sinners is a distinctively Christian term. Now, re all religions will talk about uh, uh, wicked people, evil people, it's good against evil, and so on. But at the heart of the Christian faith is the concept of salvation of sinners. Salvation of sinners. And to understand what a sinner is, you've got to understand what sin is. As God defines it. Alright? Now, here is a very simple and straightforward definition of sin. Again, it's from the book of Romans. Worthy of memorization? Romans 
3.23. If it's not already in your <laughs> vocabulary. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? The young people out there, you still, your brain cells have, have still not died. <laughs> Put it inside. Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So here is a very simple definition of sin. It tells us two things. Number one, the scope of sin is universal. All have sinned. Number two, the standard of sin, uh, that is to say, the standard for what is considered sin by God. The standard for sin is astronomical. Astronomical. Why do I say it? Uh, it, it's the standard is the glory of God. You fall short of the glory of God. The scope is universal. The standard is astronomical. Is that too much? No. Because as I said, originally, man was created in the image and likeness of God. We are the crown of God's creation. So, God made man to display his glory. That was the purpose. To display his glory. But with the entrance of sin, instead of displaying his glory, the glory has departed. Another way to understand this well is to look into the literal meaning of the Bible words that have been translated in our English versions as sin. Both in the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament Greek carries this literal meaning, which is to miss the mark. Okay, so in the olden days it would be, you know, think of shooting arrows or throwing the spear, and you miss your target, you miss the mark. And of course today, you know, if you are, uh, in, you are in, your, in the national service, you <laughs> you do your range, you take your rifle and you miss your mark or, or the missile you, you launch misses the mark. So we have all missed the mark. That's what it means when it says we have all sinned. We have all missed the mark. We have fallen short of the glory of God. That's God's standard as far as righteousness is concerned. Now, one thing about missing the mark is this. It doesn't matter whether you have just missed it by a hair's breadth or by a wide margin. Okay, if your son comes back and tells you that I failed my driving test again, but this time it's just by one mark. That doesn't make any difference. Son, you still haven't got a license and you cannot drive my car. So that's the whole idea. You see, it's still irrelevant whether I'm respectable, you just are a respectable sinner, or uh, you are religious, you are a religious sinner, or you are a rascal, you are an out-and-out -out sinner, which everybody agrees, all right? But I'm still a sinner in the eyes of God, because the original standard remains uncompromised. It's still the same, to reflect God's glory and to be untarnished by sin. So, we are all sinners needing to be saved. Now, there is another phrase there, if you haven't noticed, it says, saved from wrath. Saved from wrath means to be saved from the penalty and the punishment for sin. Which is what? Which is death according to to another verse in this Roman epistle. Again, memorize it if you don't have it in your other base. Romans 6.23. Just now was Romans 3.23, right? Romans 6.23, another great one. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. It's a comma. It doesn't end there. But, okay, <laughs> praise God. One of the Wonderful things uh, that are included in the many buts in the scriptures. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. 
So you have to recognize with everybody else these two fundamental facts of humanity. Number one, we are all born in sin. And number two, we are all destined to die. Okay, number two, I think everybody accepts, right? Everybody accepts. Uh, if you don't, you just go and attend a funeral wake. So everybody accepts. The statistics for death in Singapore are the same elsewhere. It's 100%. So I say that in Australia, I say that in the United States. Uh, but the first one, we are born in sin, not so widely accepted. But you understand from my explanation, they come from the same boat. It's the same basic issue. And the essence of what it means to be saved from sin is, in Bible language, to be justified. So how, how can I be saved from sin? is to be reckoned righteous in the eyes of God. Now, I'm not righteous in the eyes of God. I'm sinful, I'm ungodly, I'm undeserving. So, to be saved from sin, God has to see me as righteous. Now, that can only happen if somebody tastes death for me. In other words, that person takes my place for the death penalty, which is the result of sin. So that God cannot be accused of being unjust or unrighteous. It has to satisfy the righteous requirements of a just and holy God. But you know, not just anyone can be a substitute. Now you watch a soccer match, right? If somebody gets injured or somebody is not doing too well, the uh, coach might substitute someone. Now, if you are watching from the spectator stands, you are you are a big fan of that club. <laughs> you don't just jump in and say, you know, I'm going to take that place. You've got to be qualified. You've got to be pre-qualified according to the rules and regulations of the game. So it's the same thing here. The qualifying criteria for somebody to save me from sin is to be a man who is at the same time without sin. How can it be if every man and woman is born in sin? Well, Jesus is the only one who qualified because he was God come in the flesh. He was a man just like us, but yet without sin, unlike us, and therefore is the only one who qualifies to become our Savior from sin. So that is the meaning of that phrase when you read in those two verses, we are justified by His blood. Now, when somebody sheds his blood, means he lays down his life for you, it, it, it's basically dying in your place. So, we are first of all justified by the death of Christ. Makes me look righteous in the eyes of God. When he looks upon me, he looks upon Christ in me. Provided here is a proviso. What is the proviso? The proviso is in another phrase. Now, if you glance up to the very first verse of our chapter, Romans 5, in verse number 1, it says, Justified by faith. So you are justified by the blood of Christ in that it takes away your sins. But that doesn't automatically happen to everyone. We are also at the same time justified by faith in Christ. That brings us into the good of what he died for. 
makes it a personal possession, a personal reality. Now, the other thing that this verse begins with is that it demonstrates God's love to us. It's a demonstration of the love of God that Christ died for us on this day 2,000 years ago. It's a demonstration of the love of God. I, I can say that this is the Apostle Paul's version of the most well-known verse in John 3.16. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God. Isn't that a beautiful verse which I guess people who memorize this one, this one would be the number one candidate. Now, many of you might have heard of the great 19th century American evangelist by the name of Moody. Not so many people have heard of Morehouse and other fellows starting with M. He is not American, he is British. He was converted from a very wild past and a much younger man. And he said he would like to visit Moody's church, Moody's church in Chicago one day. And one day he appeared. And Moody wasn't too impressed. He was going away to preach, so he asked his officials, you know, just let him take some weeknight meetings until I come back for the weekend. And then I'll take back the pulpit. Didn't think much of that. And Morehouse preached on John 3.16, the first night, the second night, the third night, the fourth night, fifth night, sixth night, and the seventh night. And when Moody came back from his trip, he asked his wife, how did it go? She said, wow, never heard anything like that. Moody was a little uh, disconcerted. You know, when your own wife says that this fellow is really good, must be something's happening. And so he sat down to listen to his message. And he, it changed the way he preached thereafter. And that is why Morehouse is sometimes described as the man who moved the man who moved the world. You may not have heard of him, but he influenced Moody to that degree. Just by preaching on John 3.16 for seven nights in a row. So back to here, at the cross, that's what we see, the demonstration of God's love. It's the culmination, it's the intersection of God's mercy as well as his judgment. They meet together there. At the cross, God's love is displayed. But at the cross, also, God's justice is dispensed. And at the cross, also, God's wrath, saved from his wrath, has been dispelled. And in the unforgettable words of Wesley's timeless hymn, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Well, stop there. Not much time left. Number three. The third pair in verses 10 and 11, I'll summarize this third reason as follows. Christ died for what purpose? To reconcile us to God when we were enemies. Christ died to reconcile us to God when we were enemies. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, so that's a reference to his death, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Note that phrase. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now, we talked about the ungodly, we talked about the sinners, 
And now here is enemies of God. Christ died for us when we were enemies. Now most people who haven't the slightest interest in God would never describe themselves as enemies of God. You know, I mean, I, I just don't believe in God. It's irrelevant to my life. But I'm not an enemy. Um, I love everybody unless they step on my toe. But who is an enemy? It's somebody who is against you, right? That's an enemy. And the Lord Jesus once said, this is in Matthew 12, 30, in Luke eleven twenty three, He who is not with me is against me. So if you are not with God, you are against Him. If you are not His friend, you are His enemy. That's the definition. So, friends, you don't have to hate God to be His enemy. All you need to do is to be ignorant of God, to be indifferent to God, and to be indignant with God. You are ignorant when you say, I don't know about God, I couldn't care less. You are indifferent to God, I don't know and I don't care about God. And when you are indignant with Him, you are mad about God. And some people are all their lives angry because they attribute to God what they did not have. And so the root of this antagonism towards God, enmity towards God, is really alienation from God. You are alienated from the life of God. What is alienation? It's a sense of separation. It's a feeling of being excluded. It's a feeling of being estranged from God. And you can apply this to uh, normal feelings. People feel alienated. They can feel alienated from the sense of community, the family, the church, the workmates, their friends, and so on. And often, this is the cause and, uh, of, of teenage rebellion. That's what, that's what happens. They are angry and they are anti-authority because they feel disconnected emotionally. There, there is a, a loss of sense of belonging. And that happens spiritually with us. The best of men and women are alienated from the life of God. These are not my words. They are the words of Paul in Ephesians 4.18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. So, it is salvation from sin that will remove this antagonism against God because it removes this sense of alienation from God. And this is what is called reconciliation here. Reconciliation is restoring the ruptured relationship that we have with God because of sin. When you are reconciled with somebody whom you regard as your enemy, your adversary, well, formerly you were foes, and now you become fast friends. And in fact, the Lord Jesus uses that word to describe our relationship with Him if we receive Him as Savior. In John 15, 13, it says, Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And this is the supreme, this is the ultimate reconciliation in life. Wonderful if you get reconciled with your neighbor whom formerly you had a big quarrel with. Praise God for that. But this is the ultimate reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ. Uh, I have to tell you 
and press home the meaning, the word meaning of the word reconciliation. Uh, the New Testament Greek word katalasso, which is translated here, reconcile, means this. It means a thorough change, a complete change. Okay, so the emphasis is not just on relationship getting together. The emphasis is on a change, a thorough change. And this change in attitudes, in behavior towards somebody else begins with a change in thinking, in our mind. And what is the Bible word for change of mind? It's metanoia. Repentance. Repentance, metanoia, metanoia means to change your mind, to change your thinking, to God's way of thinking. So repentance has nothing to do with feelings of remorse. It has everything to do with a change in your thinking, and then your feelings will change, not the other way around. So can you see, repentance, change of mind and thinking, leads to reconciliation, a thorough change in your behavior. Uh, if it doesn't begin there, it's just cosmetic change. And finally, let me just say a few things about that phrase, saved by his life. Always, we talk about the fact that we are saved by the death of Jesus. That's right. But what does this mean? We are saved from the wrath of God. We are saved from the wrath of God by the death of Christ. But we are also saved by His life. Well, it simply means that salvation is not just from sin, but for eternal life, to eternal life. So we are saved not just by the fact that he died on the cross on Good Friday, but by virtue of the fact that he rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday. He's rising again. His life didn't just end on Good Friday afternoon. He conquered and vanquished death by his resurrection on the third day. And so because he lives, we can live the rest of our earthly lives with this absolute assurance of eternal life, without dread of physical death, because it's simply for the believer in Christ a door to eternity. So if this is what Jesus died for, what does it mean for me? He died for the ungodly, he died for the sinner, and he died for enemies. And if all of those includes me, then thank God for Good Friday. Because I can then be saved from sin and have eternal life through Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. Shall we pray? Our Father, we take these moments to not just reflect. We have gone through that in the Scriptures and pray your Spirit will quicken our hearts with it. But take these moments to deeply, deeply thank you with heartfelt appreciation once again. How meaningful it is for us to remember the Lord Jesus in the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper again today as we do every Lord's Day. But make it special today so that the richness and the gravity of your unprecedented and finished work may be upon our hearts in a fresh and a new and a powerful way. And if there are any in our midst who have yet to recognize some of these things or who have yet to receive Jesus as 
his or her Savior for the salvation from sin and to receive eternal life. We pray that your Spirit might work in such a heart so that He will let you do what only God can do. And indeed we pray, Father, that you will do for this one and that one what no man can do, but only you can do. We pray for the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, that it may shine on them so that they will be called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And for all of us, we do pray that we will walk worthy of the liberty by which Christ has made us free. We pray all this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for us on this day. Amen.